My guest today is Julie Lerman. Julie, how are you? Oh, doing great, David. Uh, you know, it's cold outside and we're stuck at home and all that. But, you know, yeah, doing okay. And you? Could be a lot worse. There's yeah. There's a lot of craziness in the world. And, uh, well, I know kind of you're in an apartment in a big city, so that's a lot different than me because, you know, I can I can go outside and I can go for walks on my road and there's nobody around and go ski in the woods. So really, no, I right can't now? complain. Pardon me? Where are you? I live Where in you? Vermont. Beautiful Vermont. Beautiful city. Beautiful and state, I'm, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm sure the population of our whole state is still smaller than the population of your city. So I can understand making uh, that mistake. About, about 3 million people live in the city of Chicago. Like yeah, we're like 600,000, I think. Entire in state. The state. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> That's my neighborhood. <laughs> 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 uh, and uh, tell us, what do you do for a living, Julie? Well, I have been working for myself for over 30 years um, in, in software. So I used to do a lot more uh, production coding back in the old days when one person could write, in and write and be responsible for an entire application. And I never really grew. I didn't want to hire people and gross into a company now that, you know, you really need lots of people to be involved in in decent sized software. So uh, what I've evolved, even though I'm maintaining some of that really old software still, which is kind of funny. Um, uh, so what I do more these days is coaching other software teams. And um, I also do uh, create a lot of content. I do videos for Pluralsight. I act, I've written a bunch of books, but I haven't done that in a while. I wrote a column for MSDN magazine for 10 years, but they shut that down about a year ago. And I'm still writing. I love to write. So I'm writing articles for Code Magazine a lot now. Hmm. Um, so I think that covers it. Yeah, I think it's the, the writing and the online presence is how I first heard about you before we met. Um, and uh, you've, you've kind of established yourself as the world's expert on entity framework. I think that's a fair statement. So when people yeah. think entity framework, they often think of you because of all the books you've written and all the, the videos you've created. Yeah, that was kind of accidental. Um, yeah. yeah, because when Microsoft first, they, uh, I, I did a lot of work with their data platforms anyway. And when they first showed me what they were working on, it was still, it had just come out of Microsoft Research. I had never used, so Entity Framework is an ORM, which is Object Relational Mapper. So its point is so that when you're interacting with data in your applications, um, you know, your applications, you have classes, and well, now we have document databases and NoSQL, but, but more commonly back then, all we really had was relational databases. So, you know, writing your queries, uh, and then getting that data back and then transforming the rows and columns into uh, into objects, right? It was a lot of really redundant work, boring work, yeah. right? Uh, sure. And we want to fo focus on you know, the problems that we're solving in our domain. So an object relational mapper takes a lot of that away. So it, can, it you know, creates the connections. Uh, you write queries, um, well, in, in Entity Framework, you write them using Microsoft's Link, which is a query language, and then it translates uh, Entity Framework along with the provider that you're using for the particular database, whether it's, you know, SQL Server or Oracle or MySQL or SQLite or et cetera, et cetera, lots of them. Um, it will translate that into SQL. It will take care of executing the query. It will bring back the rows and columns, and it will transform them back into the objects for you. So all of that uh, work, right, is just yeah, done. The, pl the plumbing. Yeah, and it and it also um, does that does the same kind of work for saving. Also, when if you edit or insert yeah. or delete data, it will it will 
pro do all of that interaction with the database for you. So that's what an ORM is. I had never used one before. So when they showed me this ORM they were working on, they didn't even have the name Entity Framework on it yet. I think it was 2006 in Boston at TechEd. Um, I was like, oh, this is cool, right? Like, oh, I'm curious, how does it work? So I started playing with it. Now, this was Microsoft's third attempt at an ORM. So people who are more oh, familiar. I, about, I remember a link to SQL. No, it was, no. I remember the third one. It, it oh. was, no, well, link, link was not even created. Link was created by the C Sharp team, not, okay. didn't come through data. That's a whole nother story. Uh, yeah, that's a whole so that's other a story. One. Yeah. Um, so the people who were aware of the previous attempts were like, then, you know, they already tried twice. This isn't going to happen. So everybody ignored it. And I just kept going, oh, this is cool. How does it work? And there was nothing really written about it. Right. So I was really had the fun of exploring and sharing what I was learning. And then... They released it and said, this is how you're going to access data in .NET apps. And so everybody was like, okay, Julie. And all of a sudden I was <laughs> like, because I was the only person who knew anything about it. Not only, but, you know, I had knew a lot. Anyway, so that's how that was uh, kind of accidental. However, that was many years ago, many years ago. And any framework has evolved continuously. Um, you know, it's not one a, a, a technology that they've, you know, threw over the wall and then came up with a new one, right? They've innov they right. keep innovating on it, so it's been a lot of fun keeping up with it, and at, you know, every new version, looking to see what's what's going on and how best to use it, and and then sharing that information with other people. So. Yeah. Where does this Where does this product stand now? What What version are we on, for example? Well, uh, let me let me count how many versions there have been because the version we're on does not reflect how many versions. So there was originally Entity <coughs> Framework One, then the next version mm -hmm. was called Entity Framework Four, not Two. Of course it was. <laughs> so that's Is that the second one. With C sharp? Is that why? Yeah. And, 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 yeah. With dot net. Yep. Dot net four. EF5 and EF6, so that was four of them. And then okay. as .NET got its whole big rewrite and became open source, et cetera, um, Entity Framework did the same thing. They, re did, they said, if we want to go, op you know, go to open source and do all of that, the code base just is too limiting, you know, because it was already an old code base. So they rewrote it from scratch. And when as .NET went to this new way of being, its new kind of new life, and got renamed mm -hmm. to .NET Core, Entity Framework renamed itself to Entity Framework Core to align with .NET Core. So now we have, we still have Entity Framework six, like the latest version of the old way of doing it, EF6, because there's millions of applications that were using it. So they didn't want to force people to all switch over, right? Especially if they're okay. not changing things, if they're not modifying it. So those applications would still work. And they still um, do little tweaks and bug fixes and, and uh, take pull requests on EF6. So EF6 is still out there. So then they, you know, went on this new track, right, of EF Core came along. So EF Core, and there was a big conversation about numbering also. And they decided since, you know, it was rewritten from scratch and this first time out was really a version one kind of a version, like, yeah, it's mm -hmm. really bleeding edge. So they went back to one. So, so we're at EF6, which is the fourth version. Then we get EF Core version one, two, three, and five. <laughs> I had to stop and think about it. Oh, they skipped four. Skipped four. <laughs> and the reason they skipped four mm. is because we now have .NET 5, right? Be again, to go along okay. with the .NET naming. So I've never really done this before. So that's eight different versions. <laughs> okay. 
Thank right, you. So you said no, they I know renamed how to count it. Rena- they didn't actually rename it. They actually uh, re- recreated it. They rewrote it from scratch to be um, compatible with .NET Core. And, and they yes. kept the old one. Yes. And not only compatible, but because they'd rewritten it, they rewrote it in a way that would make it possible and easier for them to evolve it further and modernize it further. So they used modern software practices, um, you know, and also like .NET, it's all on GitHub and it's open source and completely transparent. Hmm. So, Hmm. and there we are. So EF Core 5 just got released in November along with .NET 5 and ASP.NET Core 5. Ah. I, I always find it interesting when you get new versions of a software that's been around for uh, 15 years or so, which is a long time in the software world. Uh, you know, it seems like the product is so mature. What more features could they add to it? A lot. So what? What? what and is because new as we that? evolve and core. as our needs evolve, um, yeah. they they are. You know they can make it smarter, but another another important thing that they really needed to do was uh, bring in all the features we were reliant on in EF6, and they um, kind of uh, um, oh this is this is pre coffee <laughs> thinking pre coffee <laughs> brain what's that word again um, so they prioritized features that to to bring over so they weren't just like copying and pasting how it worked before um they mm-hmm. were able to improve on how they work a really good example is the many to many support that we had since the mm-hmm. beginning of entity framework through entity framework 6 but when any when they came out with the new the new lifetime ef core uh they didn't mm-hmm. re-implement many to many there was another way to do it but they didn't re-implement it in the way that was, you know, the easy way to use it. Oh, and the reason was the, the original implementation had a lot of limitations. So they waited until, uh, you know, they had evolved EF core enough to build on, to build on that. And they finally brought back many to many relationships, but it's so much, it's actually, it's really fascinating, uh, how how it works now but it's so much better so it has that uh, simplicity that we had at the in the original one but it also has a lot more capabilities than than we could use bef- use before so uh, you know so there was some of that people were like why can't you just bring it back but you know they they really needed to set ef core up in order to come up with uh a way that wasn't as restricted as it was before. So, you know, we had a way to do it. It was worth the wait. I, I think it was worth the wait. And I think people are pretty happy with the new way. So there's a lot of that too. Like what more is there to do? It's to take this new entity framework, EF Core, and make it as feature rich as EF6 had been after its whole evolution. Uh, so is um, it's, it sounds like there was a number of years where uh, EF Core didn't have all the features. Of Absolutely, EF6, which maybe yeah. prevented people from migrating. Maybe yes. that was a impediment. Uh, is that are they finally um, feature? Uh, uh, I forgot the word, but the, <laughs> do they finally have, does EF Core finally call in terms of the features that EF6 yeah. had? Parody, uh, thank you. Pretty close. So I think the biggest, um, you know, like I said, they they prioritized it. So many to many, for example, there was a way to do it, and it and there were less people that it was important for, right? So it's like, who's it impacting? So they had to focus on other things first, right? The the kinds of things that like everybody needs. Um, but yeah, with EF Core Five, we've got a lot a lot more parity. There was a lot of uh, some big things that came into EF Core Five. Um, so as it, with EF6, I'm going to back up. Um, in the very early stages of Entity Framework, all those, you know, decades ago, uh, there wasn't built-in logging, right? But, you know, so we had to kind of use, make our own. If we wanted logs coming out of the Entity Framework, we had to kind of do our own thing or use a third party. 
Um, mm. But then with the EF6, they had given this a really simple way to log. It's kind of pretty simple. You had to do some configuration. Um, but then you could just take a query, like to log your queries and, and different things. And you could take a query, you could take your, uh, what you're executing and just like put dot log at the end of it or something. I, I can't even remember. It's been so long. Um, but it was really easy. Like once you had set it up, it was just like, okay, log this stuff. And, uh, you could say log it to a file or log it to debug window or right. console or whatever. So... Um, with EF Core, with what they did, they started out doing was uh, they had not that kind of logging, but .NET Core had has a really good logging API. So instead of having its own thing that was completely separate, they uh, added onto you know expand they in Entity Framework they had extended uh, the .NETs logging capabilities so you could use them to so dot net already knew how to put to the console put to here put to there and capture things so they said well let's just you know use that right so you could just uh yeah. with an extension but there was a lot of setup a lot a lot uh it was it wasn't obvious it's configuration yeah um so they evolved that over time, but then with EF Core 5, they they actually just simplified it so much so that if you want, there's a really simple way of logging now that still mm -hmm. taps into, it still blends into um, the .NET's logging API, but there's no, there's no ceremony really for setting it up. You can still mm. go more deep if you want to and go into the more ceremonious way where you can do more complicated things. Right. But it's mm -hmm. just really nice to just have like, just, you know, when you're configuring the context through which you're uh, doing all your queries and saving and, and tracking your changes where, well, where entity framework is doing all that. You just tell the context, Oh, by the way, can you log, you know, log to, it's a method log to, you know, mm -hmm. console, and some filters, right? Like I want everything or I only want the commands or whatever, right? It's just one method log to instead of all the ceremony. But again, you can, you can go more complicated. And another thing that made a lot of people happy, and again, it was something that, you know, not everybody needs, but the people who need it really need it. So it was driving them batty that Entity Framework Core didn't have it, which was... Um, T table per uh, table per hierarchy inheritance. I'm not sure what that is. My point exactly. <laughs> right. What is it? What is it? Um, so, t so there's table per type. There's two kinds of hierarchies. So if you have uh, an entity in your model, you know, a class in your in, in your domain, um, and another class that inherits inherit uh, inherit. I always do inherit implement. Oh my God. Um, another class that inherits from it. Okay. Um, you can either put all of the details in one table or, or split it up. So that the hierarchy. So if you have, say you have a class called pet, right. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's like, you know, how many legs, what color, whatever. Right. And then, uh, you have a, I have a, you, Inherit from that. I know I'm doing it. I'm doing implement and inherit. Oh, yeah, this is this is my called, no coffee class brain. Called fish. No, right. You have a class called fish. Fish. That inherits and from and one pet, but dog. also has gills or something like that. Right. Exactly. <laughs> right. It has additional data. So right. entity framework has the option, or and you like when you're storing that information, you might want to store all of the fields. So if you have a fish, you've got a table, a pet table. Right. And then you've got with that pets columns and then, you know, you've got this other data about gills and uh, if it's freshwater or uh, or saltwater, whatever. I don't know much about fish. I yeah. just eat so you them. only have to have a How few, tasty a few they columns are. in the inheritance. Table. Right. So so <laughs> table table per hierarchy would or table per type would just store all of those fields in the same table together in the same table. T 
table per hierarchy means for each each uh, class in the hierarchy would have a different table. So if you have a fish, mm. some of the data, the, the common data that belongs to pet gets stored in a pet table. And then the special data for fish gets stored in a fish table. So that's table per that hierarchy. Sense. Table per type is everything in the type, even derived types are in the same table. So you'd have duplicate data in the table per type model because you might have a fish table and a cat table, and they would both have pet information. Well, you wouldn't have duplicate data, but you would have a lot of, maybe a lot of unused, if you have many different ty types yeah. that derive from it, mm -hmm. you'd have a lot of columns that are empty. Wow, okay. Right, because if you have, say you have four properties for cat and three properties for dog and six properties for fish, right? You're, you're not going to be populating all those each oh, time, right? Mm -hmm. So it's just, you know, preference. Uh, it, right. and, it, and also how you choose them has an impact on queries and, and all that kind of stuff too. I really haven't worked with them a lot because it's just recent. The only time I would work with them is if I'm doing demos uh, or if, uh, I've got a client who is working with that and I have to help them with it, right? So I just haven't had any clients using that as of late. So it hasn't been high on my radar. Uh, yeah, I think my, my guess is that this idea comes out of the uh, the NoSQL data folks who would, uh, wouldn't be uncommon to store dogs and cats and fish in the same table, even though they don't have the same properties. Because they, that's that those uh, those columns are not forced in a NoSQL table. Right, uh, they don't. There's not that wasted right. empty column that you would have in the, in the relational model that you just described. However, the concept of table per hierarchy has been around table per type versus table per hierarchy has been around a lot longer than our our NoSQL databases. Uh, so it's uh, not that okay. they <laughs> it's not that it came out of there, but that's interest. That's actually a really interesting way of thinking about it. Very nice. So <laughs> I'm glad I could contribute something. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, this is this is good because you're learning and asking questions, right? So that's, that's how other people. That's the reason I do this show. That's the reason yeah. I talk to you because I learn so much. Right. If you knew it already, you wouldn't have questions to ask me, or they would be <laughs> fake questions. You'd be saying, "What about?" And you're going, "Yeah, I already know." Let's. I'm just testing her. That's what it would be. The whole thing would be a test. <laughs> That's what the first part was. When I asked you where you live, I already knew where you lived. <laughs> uh, so what's, yeah, uh, is it, um, those are the major things in, uh, in the newest version of EF Core, EF Core 5. Oh, there's tons. Uh, there's the many to many, the simplified logging, the uh, um, table hierarchy uh, or type, <laughs> table type versus table hierarchy. I've forgotten the name of this uh, already. Oh, there's, there's. Uh, is there anything else that's new? Well, uh, let me just say it this way, that uh, I can't remember the tally. The last time I looked at the tally, there were over 200 new features in, you know, for oh. as of GitHub, right? And like, you know, AI, I, I like hundreds of bug fixes and little, you know, all kinds of things going on. But there is a, um, there is a page in the docs I'll give you a link to it, but it's a it's a list from and it, and they, it covers as each preview and then release candidate of Entity Framework Core was released. They listed all the new features that were brought into EF Core Five as it was being built up, and there's a lot that's. There, there are so many. Like if I, I'm scrolling up, starting at preview one, like there's the simple logging, um, but I'm seeing like 15 things just there. Maybe 20 I'm things. At the page as well. Yes. So the event you, counters and property bags and save changes, interceptions and events. Yeah, you know, and some of them uh, are little, like query translation for bitwise operators, right? Maybe little. Mm -hmm. Little, but it, but big for the people who need them, right? Query translation. A bunch of stuff on migrations as well. Yeah, there was a lot of a lot of work done on migrations. Bryce Lamson is always very proud of that. 
and we're always very grateful for that. So that's just, I, you know, some of these, I, I can't, I can't remember all of these, right? And I'm looking at some of these again and going, oh, right, oh yeah, I forgot about that, right? Like you can change, right? Because I, I just can't. There's so many. Uh, here's one: connection or connection string can be changed on initialized DB context, right? So normally. When you initialize a context, and the context is how you're going to perform your queries and save changes, right? Interact with the database. It's the it's the conduit to the database, um, and it also not only does is doing that interaction, but it keeps if if the context is in scope, it keeps track of all of the objects that it knows about, and it keeps track of their state, right? So um, by default, it does that. So when you in instantiate a DB context, it you need it needs to know what's the, you know, what kind of database am I using? So that's you know, which database provider do I plug into, like the SQL Server provider that's written for EF Core or the SQLite provider, et cetera, um, and also the connection string, right? And then it's able yeah. to do all that stuff. Now, you can actually change the connection string even after it's initialized. Like you might huh. want to, I don't know, persist to a bunch of different, you might, you might, I don't know, store some data here and store some data there. I don't know. I can't even imagine doing it because I've got such a DDD brain, domain driven design brain that I just think, you know, one context would align with one database. But um, you could dynamically connect to different databases now, which is, you know, a, an interesting thing. Nothing I ever looked for. Yeah, I don't, um, I don't know if this would uh, fit into this model, but if I wanted to, for example, store things in a relational database and then also dump essentially the entire object into blob storage just as a log, maybe that might be an example. Yeah, so yeah. So sometimes you just want to take the raw data and dump it somewhere so you've got a copy of it. And then start to split your relationship, your models up into the relational models. Two different right. And my there. my brains would my brain would say, well, then I'd probably want to just have a serv, you know, a service. Call that service and let the service know, like have a, you know what I mean? I I would just kind of split it up. I I don't know. So like I said, it's not something I I because of the way I think about uh, architecting software designing software like I'm sure um, if like here here's an interesting way to learn this stuff so in the in the documentation there they link to the github issue right so I'm going to link to the github issue because somebody maybe said uh, you know we want to do let's see I'm looking you know kind of going through um, clicking through the issues to find somewhere somebody says, I need this because. Um, yeah. uh, these, these issues aren't created in a vacuum. They're created because somebody was, was having an issue that and this, yeah. presumably this feature solves that problem they're having. Yeah, people, people definitely want it. So not everybody thinks the same way I do, right? And I'm not saying right. my way of thinking is better than somebody else's way. This is just how ha how I happen to do it. So I wouldn't I I but but your idea makes so much sense. Interestingly, there is a provider, an NA framework core provider for Cosmos DB, yeah. which is a, you know, a NoSQL, a document database, Microsoft's Azure. I mean, that's your your thing, right? Azure yeah. document, Azure stuff, right? So Cosmos mm -hmm. DB. So you literally could, well, actually, I think this was about changing the connection string. So you, so let me go back to that. So I don't think you could also change the provider. I wonder if you could also change its connection or connection oh. string can be changed uh, without any connection or connection string. Also the connection. Yeah, it doesn't just say connection string. It says connection. So maybe you literally hmm. could do that. You could say, okay, I'm, I'm saving changes. And first I want it to go 
to the SQL, this SQL Server database. That means you have to tell it a SQL Server provider because the SQL Server mm -hmm. provider knows how to do the last bit of work like that's specific to right. SQL Server. And and here's the connection string to that. Then then you could say, okay, uh, before you uh, well that you'd have to do. I think of this through. You'd have to you you couldn't use defaults because once you saved it to SQL Server, once you did that first save, then a framework will say, okay, everything's saved. There's no changes anymore. Everything's back to nor you know un no changes. So it would forget. Yeah what it just saved. So you, you couldn't, mm. right? But you can, you can override all that stuff, right? And, and then, mm. you know, in the same context, that's still tracking the same things, say, okay, now I want to use the Cosmos DB provider. Here's the connection string, dump it into there. And that would be as, a, as like a JSON document. So, yeah. Just sure. I've, winging uh, it. I've never this, tried uh, it. One th yeah, one thing I've done in the past, and I don't know if this is appropriate for this scenario, is uh, sometimes I'll have uh, multiple databases, even though they're both SQL or they're both Oracle or both they're all the same provider. But I may have uh, a kind of a, a master database that has you know company wide information, and then maybe a separate database for each customer. And I may on the yeah. same well, transaction, yeah. I may want to populate both or get data from both. And that's uh, and sometimes that's a challenge, especially if there's referential integrity involved, because of course SQL doesn't have any referential integrity across databases. Uh, but right, um, your application may know that and may enforce that. Right, right. So if you have databases for different customers using your software, right? Yeah, something like that. I'd, <laughs> I don't know. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. So, so <laughs> what? I, so, but this is how I learn, right? I look at that and I'm like, yeah. you know, there's how to, and there's why to, right? Yes. Like, just because you know how to do something, it, I think it's useful to know why you would do it. So instead of just using it randomly, so <laughs> in that particular case. You, you saw how, how I started. I'm like, okay, well, let me go and look at the GitHub issues related to this to see if I can, mm -hmm. uh, you know, see, like, you know, see, like, what reasons were written down, like, people saying I need it because. And if I didn't see that, then I would start Googling and looking to see if somebody wrote a blog post or if I can find a conversation somewhere, right? Like, that's how I learn. <laughs> Because I, I don't know everything. <laughs> Sorry to uh, say. What's, uh, we're, we're just about at time. What's um, ah. the uh, If somebody wants to learn more about Entity Framework, specifically EF Core 5, where's a good place to start? Well, um, I, I of course, a shout out to the Microsoft Docs. The documentation is great. However, if you just want to get started, like just look at it and, and learn about it from the beginning, I did just publish... Uh, the latest version of my Pluralsight course, getting uh, Entity Framework Core, getting started. Um, so that's a, and I, so I completely updated it for EF Core five. So it's a completely beginning with EF Core. It's not like you know high level high level stuff, but yeah, you know, things like the logging are in there and just the the basics of of working with it. So if you like learning that way, you know by video, of course I'm going to recommend that. Um, and I also wrote, a, well, I wrote an, I, I did an, a webinar for Pluralsight that was more aimed at people who are using Entity Framework Core and want to move to Entity Framework Core 5. So that's also on Pluralsight. And uh, what is that called? <laughs> you think I'd know off the top of my head. Uh, come on, show me my... Show me my things. Ah, it's called Preparing Your Move to Entity Framework Core 5, What's New and What's Improved, right? So that's a different focus as opposed to just starting from scratch. Um, mm. Yeah, or... Um, that's also on Pluralsight? Yeah, yeah, that's on Pluralsight. Oh, I see it right here. And um, I've written some articles for Code Magazine on it. I did a big, a really big article on, on EF Core 5, and that's more um, for for people who are already using EF Core to another. You know, it's again that perspective of uh, you know here's some of the key interesting things that are new to EF Core with EF Core Five. So it's more 
targeted at people who have already been using EF Core or or older version of Entity Framework. Um, so I mean, there's you know, that's just some of them. But uh, the docs are great, and it's really interesting to watch the team get more uh, more invested in the documentation. They're really making a big, big push on not just the how to, but the why tos. You know, that really important, like what you know kind of good practices for using different features and how to solve certain problems. Excellent. Julie, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Oh, yeah, David, it's fun. Always fun to talk with you, whether, you know, for <laughs> for this kind of a thing or just going out to dinner in Chicago. I still oh, I think about that here. restaurant. Oh, what was that called? Oh, Les Girl. Italian place. Les oh, Garola. so good. <laughs> well, yes, when, when thank this craziness you. ends, you'll have to come back. Or I can come yes. to Vermont and you can show me some good country cooking. Well, I've been, pr I've been trying to figure out how to make, you know, kale or spinach that tastes <laughs> about like that. So, yeah, we'll see how it goes. All, All right. right Thanks, safe. David. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Even though I'm missing so many of my friends in face-to-face -face get-togethers. I'm so glad that we have the technology to keep us together online.